Bien, je... je vous remercie d'être là avec nous pour la session de l'après-midi la, qui sera consacrée à la suite euh, du point de vue chronologique des, des présentations que nous avons eues ce matin. Et donc la session accueillera trois euh, intervenants euh, dans l'après-midi, euh, des interventions qui seront consacrées donc, principalement au disons, 17, fin XVIIe et au XVIIIe siècle des différentes unions ecclésiastiques. Donc, euh, je vais vous présenter euh, tout d'abord donc, euh, donc Madame Violetta euh, zilatska qui, euh, qui, qui est docteur habileté, qui est maître de conférence, je dis maître de conférence comme Dominique me l'a souligné ce matin, <rire> qui est maître de conférence à l'université de Nicolas Copernic de Torougne, qui est historienne, qui est spécialiste véritablement de, des unions ecclésiastiques. Elle a travaillé au départ plutôt sur l'histoire sociale, elle a, elle a fait sa thèse sur les testaments euh, des, des orthodoxes et des uniates, donc vous voyez euh, en référence aux questions que nous avons évoquées ce matin, et elle a fait son habilitation sur la, le diocèse de Pchemich, qui euh, se distingue par le fait que c'est l'un des diocèses uniates qui a cons, le plus conservé ses archives dans un état assez euh, exceptionnel. Voilà, donc, so Violetta, thank you very much for being with us, and I leave the stage for you, for 30 minutes, please. Good afternoon, thank you very much for invitation. <coughs> Uh, tradition and change, the functioning of the Union Episcopal Curia in the 18th century. Epis uh, Episcopal Curia in the Kievan metropolis in the 18th century were a central element in the governance of the diocese, both in terms of or uh, organizing the work of the eparchy's immediate environment and exerting influence of the parish clergy and the faithful. The term diocesan curia should therefore be understood as an instrument that permanently assists the bishops in the exercise of ordinary executive and judicial power, as well as in pastoral activity, but not legis legislative power. The study of the functioning of these bodies in the Kievan metropolis over a long period of time encounters difficulties for several, uh, several uh, reasons. Uh, okay. uh, several reasons. The first is the, is the complicated history of the Union Metropolis of the Kiev in the 17th century, in the confusion of which part of the legacy of the Union was, was lost. Also, materials from the 18th century, when the Union Church underwent a period of organizational reform, have not been completely preserved to the our times, mainly due to the Russian, uh, Russian Empire's policy towards Unions in the 19th century. Uh, the archives of the diocese of Vodemir, Brest and Lutsk are considered lost. Almost all of the archives of the archbishops of Polotsk were destroyed during hostilities during Napoleon Bonaparte's Russian campaign of um, 1812. By contrast, the materials of the Keum eparchy have survived to the present day in the fragments. The situation is similar for the archives of the Diocese of Lviv, which after the partition of Poland found, founded itself within the Habsburg Empire. The archives of the Przemysl Diocese are the best preserved, providing an overview of the activities of the Orthodox authorities over a long, in the span, uh, uh, long time span. And for this reason, I, uh, I, will, most, uh, I will most of, uh, often refer to this part of the Kievan metropolis. The situation of the Episcopal Curia in the 18th century was influenced by uh, influences, uh, influences known in Orthodox structures as late as the 17th century. This, um, mm -hmm. this included the reforms of uh, Metropolitan Peter, Peter, Peter Mohyła, who expanded the environment of bishops throughout the introduction of consistories, the separate union tradition developing in the area subject to the union in the, in the 17th and 18th centuries. And 
its transformation in the 18th century aimed at preparing the church for the uh, for the age of uh, enlightenment. The process of Latinization of the Orthodox Church understood not only as the adoption of models taken from the Latin Church, but also, also uh, adapting them to the conditions and the needs of the Union Church was uh, was of great importance. Uh, the group accompanying the bishops, com uh, com um, comprising both laity and clergy, was referred uh, um, to as the Curia Episcopalis, Curia Nostra. Uh, Curia Nostra. The Episcopal Curia, in the broad, uh, broad sense, was divided into, in, uh, into two se uh, segments, the Bishop's Court and the Officialite, that means consistory. The supporting institution f uh, for them was the Court Chancellery. At the same time, it should be stressed that it is very difficult to draw clear boundaries uh, between these three individual elements, as there was a tradition among the union bishops of combining offices within the broadly defined Episcopal Curia. It is very evident in the, uh, in the example of the offices of scribes who, um, who served bishops, uh, bishops and uh, consistory at the same time. And the first, the bishop's court, that means familia. The requirements of the composition of the bishops, mm -hmm. uh, of the, um, the requirements for the uh, composition of the bishops' immediate entourage were formulated in the 1730s by Metropolitan Joseph Velamin Rutsky. It was to consist of five people, which should include mainly Basilian monks, and it was from the background that the bishops came. The recommendation was intended to foster a greater sense of the bishops' bond with their order, a monastic state committed to poverty. This included the bursar, administrator of the Episcopal estate, the superior uh, of the Episcopal house, that means prefectus domus, uh, the steward treasurer, dispensator, the scribe, that means notary, and the cook, salarius. Elements of these recommendations can be clearly seen in the first half of the 18th century, when Basilians were still a regular part of the bishop's immediate entourage. It was only as a result of a recommendation from Rome ordering the removal of the Basilians from the di uh, diocesan authorities and the decisions of the uh, 1720 Synod of Zamość expressed in the same spirit that the place of the Basilians was taken by diocesan clergy for the 1740s onwards. As for the function in the Episcopal Curia itself, the most stable and probably the most important was the bishop's estate treasurer, whose job is, was to manage the bishopric estates. His, included, his duties included dealing with the innkeepers of village, villages, uh, inns and land, and enforcing debts owed uh, to the episcopate and managing the episcop's income. The importance of this position is demonstrated by the fact that it was untrusted the people from important diocesan monastic centers and cathedral temples. In the case of Przemysl, Basilian from the monasteries of Wawrów and Tlishnia were chosen. Among the lay clergy, it was Basili Hanczakowski, Dean of Przemysl, at the court of the Metropolitan of Kiev, Florian Hrebnicki. This function was held by Jason Smogorzewski. A special position in the bishop's court was held by the chapel whose activities included liturgical, uh, liturgical service in the bishop's chapel. During the period of Basilian domination of diocesan offices, and because of the bishop's special relationship, relationship with the Basilian order, it was they who performed this function. The Basilian Mitrofan Radziminski acted the chaplain to in, uh, Innocent Winnicki. After the role of these monks was marginalized, their position was taken by uh, lay clergy. During the reign of Orufy Szumnański, it was looked after the father Jerzy Śliwiński, in addition to their liturgical duties at the, will, uh, at the will of the bishops, the bishops' chaplains undertook a number of activities in the field of the eparchial jurisdiction. Due to the rather narrow circle of the bishops' closest 
collaborators, sometimes several functions were performed by the same person. For example, Mitrofan Radzimiński performed the duties of chaplain and treasurer of the Episcopal estate at the same time. Bishop's preacher was a clergyman, at first a, Basil at first a Basilian and then a diocesan clergy, whose task was to preach both at the bishop's office and in the diocesan cathedral. The fun uh, this function was usually assigned the person from among the bishop's closest circle, with experience in orthodox functions at the level of diocesan administration, that means office barriers, cathedral governors. The Episcopal Curia consisted of the court chancellery headed by the Episcopal scribe, chancellor or notar uh, notary. The provisions, uh, provisions of the Synod of Zamość ordered the bishop to appoint notaries within two weeks to the promulgation of the Synod decrees. A penalty was to be imposed by the Metropolitan and those who failed to, uh, failed, to do, uh, failed to do so. The notary's duties were to keep a course of action in both civil and criminal cases. In addition, his duties included keeping of the books of confessions of faith, the books of ordinations, the books of visitations, and the books of rescripts, that means book of um, bishop's grace. <clears throat> Um, according to the synodal provisions, his duty also included arch archiving, that means storing the books produced so, uh, so that they could be passed on the next bishops. In addition, it was the responsibility of the Episcopal scribe uh, to issue Episcopal orders and judgments under the seal of the eparchy. Because of the rather narrow circle of qualified people and the need to remunerate uh, the scribe for his work, usually the Episcopal scribe was the, at the same time the scribe of the, uh, the, scribe of the consistory or of the wall, uh, whole uh, Episcopal curia in general. Terms were used uh, to describe writers, pisarz biskupi, apostolicus et curia episcopalis notarius, acta curia episcopali et uh, consistoris generalis notarius. Thus, the scribe was a very influential curial official connected with the almost very area of the functioning of the Episcopal Curia. The scribe accompanied the bishops to the sessions of the eparchy court, to which cases were sent when they were referred to him by an official or when the bishop's bishop, in the absence of an official, exercised jurisdiction himself. It, if necessary, on the bishop's uh, instructions, he, exa uh, he examined individual cases referred to, uh, to him only. This could be include, for example, the clarification of conflicts, uh, conflicts between clergy. For the bishop's private needs, depending on the fi financial possibilities, the following servants were employed. Footmen and stewards, bakers, cooks. In the poorly uh, uh, endowed city of Przemysl, it was just four or five people. On the other hand, Metropolitan Wodkowicz, who came from the well-known Lithuanian family, did not stray away from lavishness, and his uh, vows of poverty were, uh, were a not major constraint for him. Uh, as is well uh, known today, such situation arose from the aspirations of members of the Union Episcopate to attain the standards of life and prestige of the rich nobility and magnates. It was important from the point of view of ensuring the security of the bishops and their, uh, their poverty, um, property, sorry, uh, property to maintain at least a substitute, uh, substitute for armed troops. This depended, of course, uh, uh, on the financial capacity and the uh, uh, parks. Metropolitan Felician Wołotkowicz maintained a troop uh, of 500 Cossacks who, in his interest, organized rights on, for example, Jesuit estates. In the poor diocese of Przemysl, the bishops used the service of several light armed infantrymen for protection. And the end of the 
uh, threat, uh, threat about the bishop's court, I left a vicar general on pastoral matter, matters. In fact, however, he was apart, uh, apart from the bishops, the most important person in the diocesan curia. The vicar general, vicarius in spiritualibus, oh, sorry, I forgot about that. Okay. <clears throat> Vicarius in spiritualibus, in the narrow sense of the, uh, of the term curia, belonged to the bishop's closest collaborators. He was the bishop's plenipotentiary in matters of fight, faith and the bishop's, bishop's executive authority. In the Union Church, at the same time, he acted as an, uh, uh, as an official general who headed a court called consistory and deputized for the bishop in the judiciary. Usually, in the Union Church, the office of General uh, Vicar General and Officiate General was held by the same, the same person. The reason for this was most likely the bishop's poor capacity for good personal education and the exec, uh, ex, uh, ex, uh, ex, uh, excessive, sorry, excessive cost of maintaining a large team, large team of uh, colleagues. The general official was an office uh, derived from, the, uh, from that of the orthodox episcopal governor uh, or general governor, who was called general officiant in, the, uh, officiant in some uh, dioceses as clergy as the 17th century. The official stood at the head of the consistory and judged in the bishop's stead, stead in his absence. He could uh, do uh, this both when the court was sitting in the bishop's place of residence or when the bishops uh, uh, could, uh, could not be involved in jurisprudence. It seems to have depend, uh, depended on either the bishops of the specifics of the diocese, whether he was permanently in the bishop's presence. For example, in the Diocese of Vodemir Brest, where the officiate of Brest had no direct territorial connection with the rest of the eparchy because uh, they were separated by the uh, territory of the Diocese of Helm, the official of Brest re uh, resided permanently in his officiate. Officiate. In the uh, middle 18th century, the metropolitan diocese had seven officiates. In the Lithuanian part, Grodno, Minsk, Novogrudek, and Vilnius. In the Ukrainian part, Bratislav, Kyiv, and Ovruc. Of this, those in Grodno, Vilnius, and uh, Kyiv acted as general officials. Mm -hmm. Uh, officials. In the Powodsk eparchy, we have the Powodsk, Mścisław, and Vitebsk uh, uh, officiate. As early as 1733, uh, uh, the official of Mścisław uh, was Bazilian Joseph Saporowicz, Arch Madrid of Troki. In the Diocese of Lviv, there were already three general governorates at the, uh, at the time of joining the Union in the year 1700. With, uh, with regard to the personal composition of the cluster of the officialdom in the 18th century, a process of uh, personal exchange can be seen. Namely, it was a matter of appointing the, uh, to these office, uh, offices first Basilian monks, usually uh, superiors of monasteries, and then a well-educated person coming from the lay clergy. This can be seen in the Diocese of Przemyś as well as in the other eparchies. Volodymyr, where, for example, Ignacy Ulinski was a Basilian, uh, and, uh, and uh, in... Uh, 1759, uh, uh, already a diocesan clergyman, Antoni uh, Kolonczewski. In 1738, their boundaries were only regulated so that the official doms knew the exact extent of the territories under the authority. But they had already adopted uh, the Latinized name of general official doms. Uh, these, uh, these were the official domes of uh, Lviv, Halic, and Kamienic. The tour of Pinsk eparchy centered around the cathedral's head uh, and uh, an officiate in the 1758, but it was probably already active uh, there earlier. In the Diocese of Przemysl, the officials almost until the 1740s came from among the Basilians. They were usually monks from the monaster, monastery in Dobromil or Wawrów. One of them was called the general officiate of Przemyśl. Both, uh, both in the Przemyśl and in other dioceses, the official was the bishop's in, uh, intermediary in his dealings with the governorate and parish clergy. 
he, uh, he resolved all matters referred, uh, referred to him by the bishops. In, uh, if there was no resol uh, resolution and the, um, and the parties uh, so, uh, and the parties were uh, dissatisfied. The cases went to the bishops. It seems that it uh, depended on the specifics of the diocese whether uh, he was often or permanently present in the bishop's immediate vicinity. This uh, was certainly the case when eparchial courts were held. In the case of a metropolitan diocese, the official general <laughs> Uh, this was uh, in the case of metropolitan diocese the official general represented the bishops uh, bishop in the public activities Metro, uh, Florian Hrebnicki often used the talents of Autonin Mołodowski who represented the head of the union church and the same Importantly, clergymen who held the of, uh, office of official dom usually did so far a few or more years. Often such experience opened the way to the obtaining a bishopric. The office of auditor uh, um, remains a very interesting case. The office was an unknown in the ancient tradition of the Eastern Orthodox Church, but it existed in the Roman Catholic Church, where it was one of the chief officials of the Bishop's Curia, dealing primarily with judicial matters, including the presidency of the Bishop's Court. Uh, in some dioce uh, dioceses, uh, the institution uh, grew, out, uh, grew out of and existed alongside the function of the surrogate, surrogate as a temporary deputy of the officiate. In the 16th century, the power of the auditor uh, passed uh, to the chancellor of the curia. In the 17th century, the of, uh, office of chancellor disappeared and the auditor took over. In the 17th century, the auditor was active in the Metropolitan Curia. Uh, Metropolitan Leon Kiszka appointed Jerzy Buchak, later Bishop of Pinsk, to this post. In the 18th century, it also existed in the Diocese of Przemyśl, uh, introdu introduced by Hieronim Ustrzycki, the first in 17. Uh, 16. But it seems that his powers were the same as, uh, as, as those of the official general. In the 1730s, uh, an audit, uh, auditor was also active in the Diocese of Volodymyr around 1730. Uh, uh, Polycarp Michuniewicz, prior to assuming the office, was super, superior of the Basilian monasteries, or, uh, monasteries uh, of Bytany, Helm, and Żyrowice. In the Polsk di Archdiocese, the auditor was Simon Michałowski, an alumnus of the Bytany Monastery in the 1737. As in the Przemysl Diocese, the post was held by Basilians educated in the monasteries, graduates of the Jesuit College, uh, Jesuit College in Braniewo, and the Greek uh, College in Rome. Uh, these were people. Uh, these were people with theolo uh, theological training and belonging to the intellectual elite of the Union Church. At the present stage of research, it is difficult to determine whether in the uh, in this diocese it was all also uh, identified with the officiate general. That means the superior of the uh, uh, superior of the consistory. Uh, the consistory acted. Um, acted under the authority of the official general, a permanent judge. In addition to him, consistories included a notary. Within the consistory, substitute judges, surrogatus in Latin, uh, were employed in, uh, acting in place of the official. Uh, initially appointed for, uh, appointed, uh, for single cases, they uh, emerged as a permanent office in the second half of the, of the 18th century. The last significant figure of the consistory was the instigator. The nature of, this, uh, of the office of instigator, instigator uh, that means public accuser, and the multitude of court cases brought before the consistory of Przemysl makes its existence uh, in the judicial structure of the diocese very early attested. He usually brought accusations against uh, suspects to the office of the official in matters concerning the broad welfare of the bishopric. 
and uh, short summary, the biggest change in the 18th century was the change of personal from Basilian, Basilians to diocesan clergy. Next change was, was increased role of uh, um, office barriers and consistories and the expense of the, on, of the involvement and bishops in the judiciary. Uh, on, the, uh, on the one hand, the functioning of the Episcopal Curia based on a vicar general and a official in an example of the union drawing uh, on the solutions of the Latin Church. On the other hand, however, it also represent, uh, represents a departure, uh, departure from the old Ruthenian models and an element of modernization of the union church. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Violetta. Merci beaucoup. Et euh, donc nous allons réserver du temps à la discussion en fin de session. Et pour l'instant, nous passons à la communication suivante. Donc nous avons le plaisir d'accueillir Melchior Jakubowski, qui est historien et historien de l'art. Il a cette double spécialité, qui travaille actuellement à l'Institut d'histoire de l'Académie polonaise des sciences et qui se spécialise dans les chantiers, disons culturels et artistiques des moines basiliens, donc ces moines réformés de l'Église Uniat Ruten. Soyou. Thank you very much. Uh, is it fine? I'll just check if it goes well. Yeah, fine. Is it fine? Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll try to present you a topic of um, Basilians and art in the 18th century, uh, but not art per se, but art as means of uh, title reconstructing unit identity. Uh, so how this spatial and architectural changes uh, reflect the broader uh, patterns, broader phenomena that occurred in the Union Church in the uh, Poland, Lithuania in the 18th uh, century. Uh, this presentation is um, part of a wider project, so that's why the next slide uh, also resembled, uh, resembles a title slide, but that's the whole project within which I'm working now. So uh, it's Jesuits of the East, Artistic Network of the Basilian Order in 18th century Poland, uh, Lithuania. And I do it uh, together with Tomasz Panetski in the Department of Historical Atlas of the Institute of History of the Polish Academy of uh, Sciences. Uh, and first, uh, Professor Zielecka have already, uh, has already told you a bit about uh, Basilians, but uh, I think it's also necessary to provide you maybe a bit more of uh, introduction about the order and its importance in the, in the church. Uh, as you know, the beginning of the Union ch Church in Poland, Lithuania, that's the Union of Brest in 1596, uh, Basilians were the only order, the only monastic community in this church. Uh, it was based, uh, so cer certainly a bit simplification, but it, generally it was organized using St. Basil's uh, Eastern rule and uh, Jesuit model of organization. And, and they were really extremely important in the Union Church. So, so bishops were elected from among Basilians, uh, as well as uh, you've uh, heard uh, bishops' officials. Um, Basilians took care on the most important sanctuaries. Uh, they provided pastoral care, educational care, very important schools, uh, printing houses, uh, and last but not least, uh, artistic activities. So basically, the 18th century, that's the golden age of the Basilian order. There were over 150 monasteries and over 1,000 monks, one of the biggest uh, monastic communities in, in the country. And they played a pivotal role in Eastern Western cultural transfer, and that's what I'm especially interested in. In um, this project by Artistic Network, uh, I understand uh, the links between humans, ideas, things, and places. And here you've got just a very basic map uh, showing the uh, location of Basilian monasteries in 18th century Poland, uh, Lithuania, so exactly about which part of Europe uh, we are talking about. Uh, 
here are the goals, questions, and hypotheses of uh, the whole project. I don't want to read uh, all of that. The uh, main question is how did the monastic network function in the unit order, so joining the traditions of Eastern and Western churches. And uh, today I'm especially interested in um, the exactly this joining uh, Eastern and Western traditions and uh, this last part, so the blue one, uh, about Basilian uh, art. Uh, the project is based on various kinds of historical sources, written, cartographic, iconographic, as well as material ones, and uh, uses uh, digital humanities to create a database of Basilian artistic activities and uh, then to visualize uh, the data and analyze it. Uh, and now I'm coming to, to the results of the project as uh, we are approaching its, uh, its finishing. Uh, here is the current stage of our work. So uh, actions, uh, artistic actions among the Basilian monasteries. I have to explain what is an action here, because action is an artificial unit uh, created uh, by myself uh, for the sake of uh, our uh, database. Uh, so by action, I understand every kind of activity of Basilians connected with either building or decorating or furnishing of the church or monastic uh, residence. Uh, so this can be uh, either a building of new structure or uh, rebuilding something or uh, placing a new altar uh, or a new iconostasis, etc. Uh, and here you can see uh, how many actions per monastery we have right now. So it's uh, quite many of them, actually. Uh, we, uh, right now uh, we have uh, over 1,300 uh, actions, and it's still a work in progress. Um, and fortunately, although as uh, you've already heard, the destruction of unit archives was very significant, uh, fortunately uh, it's possible to get uh, at least a bit of uh, data for uh, monasteries in uh, all parts of uh, uh, Poland, Lithuania, oh, especially except the West where there were no uh, units. So basic, ah, and, uh, and one another important uh, explanation, uh, I use here uh, Polish place names uh, as they appear in the historical sources from the epoch, but certainly uh, most of these places are in Ukraine or Belarus now, so just to uh, let you know that it's not any kind of uh, revanchism here. Um, and uh, a chart showing uh, how many of these actions we've recorded uh, until now, uh, with uh, a very uh, with visible tenden growing tendency throughout most of the century, and uh, uh, very uh, uh, and really good visible uh, peak in 1770s which is actually a bit surprising as 1770s, that's the time uh, of partitions of Poland, Lithuania. Uh, so from the political point of view, a very difficult time, both for the country and for, for the church. But uh, it seems that uh, not so, so bad in terms of uh, economics and, and art. And here you've got the, an overview of this title changes that occurred in the monasteries. Uh, so what I'll be talking in during the uh, next uh, few minutes. So first, that's the change of preferred location of the monastery from uh, remote places to urban contexts. Second, it's uh, changing from irregular arrangement of the ensemble to regular axial schemes. Uh, then uh, changing from timber to masonry constructions, and also uh, go 
going away from Eastern, from traditions of Eastern right architecture to those most fashionable forms of uh, Baroque, Rococo, and Neoclassicism. Introducing of uh, such uh, ob Latin objects of the church furnishing, like side altars, organs, pulpits, and confessionals. These are all uh, objects that were uh, not present in the traditional Eastern Rite churches, but uh, were typical for Latin ones, and they appeared step by step in uh, the Union churches. And a very interesting things happened with iconostasis as well, because uh, it does did not longer have to be a wall with icons. Uh, it was changed into open structures, uh, structures with frescoes, with uh, sculptural compositions, and there could be no iconostasis at all as well, exactly like in the Latin churches. And uh, I'll try to present more or less according to this schedule, uh, but in many cases the slides show uh, at least two of these uh, points, so uh, there will be no, very, no strict uh, rule here. Uh, but first, starting with uh, location of the monastery. Here we've got monastery in Zwoczów uh, Buczyna on, uh, on the left uh, on a map uh, from the 18th century and on the, in the right up corner you've got a fragment of this map showing exactly the, the monastery with a wooden church and uh, uh, located next to it uh, ex as well, wooden uh, bell tower and uh, monastic residence uh, next to it together with some economic uh, buildings with no uh, particular uh, scheme of uh, placing the objects. And the location of the monastery uh, on the, uh, in the right down corner, uh, you've got a fragment of an Austrian map from the late 18th century uh, showing that the monastery was located uh, in solitude uh, in the forest. Uh, while uh, for in the 18th century there was located also the second monastery in exactly in next to the same uh, town of Zwoczów. Do I have a pointer here? Uh, mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. Okay, so uh, basically, the previous one, B B Monastery in Buczyna, is on the right side of this map, while on the left, uh, you've got the town of Zwoczów and the new monastery in Grabina. Both names come from uh, various uh, species of trees. Uh, was located uh, in the suburbs, much closer to the, uh, to the town. Uh, but even more characteristic is the location of the new monastery in Kristinopol, uh, founded in 1760s, uh, where the monastery was located exactly in the middle of this uh, map. Uh, you've got this cross uh, and uh, something uh, and a red shape up to it. That's the church and monastery in Kristinopol, uh, as you, which you can see also in a, a photo and a plan. Uh, it was located next to the market square of this town, opposite the Bernardine church and very close to the residence of the owner of the town. Uh, so a very typical for this new pattern. And as well, you can also see that the new build new complex was uh, a masonry structure uh, with a monastic residence connected in a one composition with the church and it all has uh, for late baroque or maybe even partly early neoclassical uh, form. Uh, in Krechów uh, you can see on the right uh, the, an, an, an engraving of the monastery, a very rare case if it's an engraving from the, around the year 1700, so from beginning, turn of the 17th and 18th century. On the left, you've got a contemporary plan of, the, of this ensemble. So what you can see, uh, the outer walls of the monastery survived until today. They, were, uh, they come from the medieval times, they are of uh, stone. But inside the, uh, this 
wall circle. There stood various wooden buildings, and all of them were replaced in the 18th century by, a new, by new structures made of stone or brick with a new church and new monastic residence uh, loca loca and located in one part of this ensemble uh, and co connected uh, with each other. And you can see this uh, on the pictures here with the uh, church and uh, monastic uh, residence there. Uh, and uh, speaking about uh, most fashionable forms, a very good example provides uh, Vitebsk in contemporary Belarus, uh, where we have a contract with Josef Fontana, so architect coming from a well-known Italian uh, family of artists, Fontana, uh, and the church, uh, and it's even um, confirmed in the written sources from the epoch, was uh, planned using as a master plan uh, the church Santi Ambrogio e Carlo al Corso in Rome. Uh, so on the left side you can see a plan and a photo of this church in Rome, but actually the plan of this church in Vitebsk is exactly the same. Uh, and on the right, a historical view of the church uh, by Josef Peszka, and uh, down its current form as it was it had, as most places in uh, Belarus or Ukraine had a very complicated story because this uh, church was rebuilt in a neoclassical form in the 19th century, then destroyed, completely destroyed uh, during the Soviet period and rebuilt in the independent uh, Belarus, uh, but to its uh, neoclassical form and not to the original Baroque one, which you can see on the painting. Uh, however, arguably the most uh, powerful uh, example provides Pochayev uh, in uh, contemporary Ukraine, a huge ensemble uh, with, there was a, an old uh, monastic complex, a uh, very important pilgrimage center, uh, with all the buildings pulled down in the middle of the 18th century because of the wish of uh, noble, extremely wealthy patron, uh, Mikołaj Basili Potocki, uh, who uh, wanted to create their a new uh, complex. And it's, so all the previous structures were uh, pulled down and they built a new uh, huge church uh, with two towers, facade with a central dome and a monastic residence surrounded in, the, the surrounding it. Uh, here you can see it also on the paintings from the 19th century by a famous Ukrainian uh, poet, uh, Taras Shevchenko, uh, who painted uh, Pochayu. So you can see uh, the, also the location of the complex on a, on a hill uh, above the, the countryside and the interior of the church exactly with a very good view to the central altar, uh, which is uh, typical uh, late Baroque structure. And we can, uh, of course, we can compare, oh, sorry, that I see that uh, the uh, captions are moved, but uh, we can compare Pochayev with uh, most magnificent uh, monastic complex of the epoch. Uh, here, just as an example of the, the same uh, way of thinking about uh, a monastery uh, to uh, monasteries from uh, South German uh, area, so Otto Beuren uh, in Swabia and Melk in uh, Austria, uh, as they share with Pochayev uh, the location on a hilltop, uh, two towers, uh, facade, and in Melk we also have a central dome like in, in Pochayev. And, uh, we can, of course, uh, provide many more uh, examples. That's uh, just uh, an illustration of, the, of this uh, pattern. And then I um, told you that uh, Bavilions introduced uh, many objects uh, that are associated with Latin tradition of the church furnishing. Uh, 
Uh, and here I would like to show you some maps from our uh, database. As you know, there were over 150 monasteries. Their number was changing. As some were closed, others were uh, newly founded. But among those that we have, and of course we do not have data for all the monasteries, we have uh, in 98 monasteries uh, recorded uh, side altars. Ah, and what, what, why is it so important to record it in the archival sources? Because of the destruction, not only of the archives, but even more of the objects themselves. First, during the Russian period in the 19th century, when there was a purification of the churches that they, uh, the former union churches, to become orthodox, they had to uh, be yeah, purified of all those Latin uh, elements. So most of such objects were destroyed. Uh, the, and then we have the second wave of destruction during the uh, Soviet period, when it was not uh, destroying union objects, it was destroying everything uh, of sacral art. Uh, so uh, we have a very little examples preserved. So that's why, important, why is, is it so important to uh, focus on the archival sources. So in vast majority of monasteries, there were side altars. In 55, uh, we found uh, confessionals. In 52, pulpits. And you can see that it's in whole uh, unit uh, uh, part of the Com Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, but uh, it's different with organs. We've, we've got only 13 monasteries with organs. And only one of them, uh, the most uh, southern dot, uh, its monastery in Zamość, only one of them in the uh, Rutinian or Crown uh, province of the order, all the others uh, in the Lithuanian. So it seems that uh, here we, ha we can see a difference that uh, introducing organs to the church was more controversial than other uh, so such Latin uh, pieces of furniture. And few farther examples, a very curious case is a monastery in Warsaw, which does not look like a monastery, neither of uh, Eastern nor Western uh, tradition. Uh, from the street, it looks like an urban palace uh, of neoclassical forms uh, designed by uh, a royal architect uh, of Italian origin, Domenico Merlini, uh, with a church hidden inside this uh, complex. So uh, very interesting uh, object, unfortunately, with no original iconostasis preserved, and as it was a very original structure. Uh, it was sculpted, not painted, and it joined uh, a pulpit and a bishop's uh, throne in one uh, composition that nevertheless enabled to see the altar. Uh, another very interesting object is uh, a church, a former Union Cathedral in, in Powotsk, that uh, included the elements of the old structure. So what we can see on this uh, most right uh, photo, that's uh, the part of the walls of the original cathedral uh, from the uh, 12th, uh, sorry, from the 11th century uh, that uh, was pulled down, except of this one wall, uh, to create the new 18th century cathedral uh, as they wanted to create, to move, move the object, the church, towards the main axis of the uh, city, so the river, the river Dvina. As traditionally, Eastern churches, as in medieval times also Western churches, had to have their presbytery towards the east. But here, and in many other uh, union uh, churches, uh, this rule uh, was uh, broken, and this church has a facade uh, to the south, uh, and this form, former uh, presbytery became its side wall. Uh, but also recreated on the west side uh, of, the, of the church to make it uh, symmetrical. A very uh, interesting uh, solution. Uh, 
And here we also have partly preserved uh, furniture of the of the uh, of the church with no uh, paintings anymore. But you can see uh, the whole the, the huge. Uh, iconostasis that resembles an altar, but also side altars and uh, pulpit in this in, in, the, with, in this interior. And uh, yeah, as I see it's uh, time to finish uh, approaching. So the last part of my presentation will be about iconostasis. Uh, and very creative things that happened to iconostasis. Here is an example of a typical, traditional Eastern Rite iconostasis. Uh, you've got the sketch view of the iconostasis of the Greek Catholic Cathedral of uh, Hajdudorog, if I uh, pronounce in Hungarian correctly. Uh, with what is uh, typical for a traditional iconostasis? It's a wall of icons with rows of paintings with so-called tiers uh, devoted to different uh, topics. So uh, at the um, bottom uh, you've got uh, the mo most important paintings, therefore of the patron of the church as well as Christ and the Virgin Mary. Uh, then you've got the uh, second uh, yeah, so the base tier, uh, sovereign tier is ca called here. Then you've got number three, so um, uh, red icons, it's, these are uh, church feasts. Um, purple color, that's uh, the apostles tier. Uh, yellow, uh, the prophets. And then you've got the, the, the crowning scene, uh, more or less. And uh, basically, the Orthodox... Uh, uh, churches keep this pattern till the, today. Uh, the form, of course, differs. You can see, uh, ro for example, Rococo elements or neoclassical elements in Orthodox iconostasis. But usually you have at least par partly preserved uh, this, uh, this program, and you can see it also here in the Greek Catholic uh, churches in the Habsburg monarchy. It was also a uh, rule rather kept. While in Poland, Lithuania, it was much more complicated. Uh, here I mm, use uh, the scheme uh, drawn uh, by uh, Galina Flikopsvita, a Belarusian scholar, uh, who uh, found exactly in the archival sources uh, and reconstructed various possibilities. So on number one, it's a traditional Eastern Rite pattern. You've got iconostasis that cuts presbytery from the rest of the church and behind it an altar. But uh, what could happen in 18th century Poland, Lithuania? There could be this altar uh, moved to the wall, like in the Latin churches, that's number two. You can also have, like in number three, uh, side altars as part of the iconostasis. As, uh, the two central icons of, of, of this uh, lower tier of uh, the iconostasis are devoted to Christ uh, and uh, Virgin Mary. And in many cases in the 18th century in the Union churches, uh, they put altar tables in front of these uh, paintings, thus creating uh, side altars being also part of iconostasis. Uh, and you can also have, as number four, side altars on the sides of the iconostasis, uh, or many side altars uh, connected with iconostasis as in number five or six, uh, or as in numbers eight to ten, you can have uh, main altar and side altars, but no iconostasis at all. That was also possible. Uh, and even if the iconostasis was created, there were many creative ways uh, what to do with an iconostasis, and these uh, are, again, just uh, some possibilities. So uh, you can have, for example, like in number four, uh, lower tier and upper tier, and between them an open space that enabled to see the altar. Or you can have as number three only very little 
we can say even symbolic uh, wall uh, that nevertheless did not uh, prevent the alt central altar to be seen from the nave. Or you can also have, like in number five, uh, an iconostasis uh, painted, whole, whole iconostasis painted as an uh, uh, illusionistic uh, fresco. Uh, so, and you can also have uh, what is not shown here, uh, sculptures instead of uh, paintings, etc., etc. A wide variety of possibilities. And some, uh, some examples, uh, preserved uh, ones. So that's the uh, Union Cathedral in Lviv, where you can see the uh, iconostasis as an open structure with, that preserves this uh, royal and side doors, but you can see the altar behind it. And uh, it's not that there is no the iconographic program of the iconostasis. Of course, for example, the paintings of the apostles that would form one of the rows of icons in the traditional composition, here they are placed in these oval paintings on the side walls of the uh, presbytery, uh, another creative uh, solution. Uh, Another interesting case is in the monastery in Podhorce. We also have here a pre preserved object uh, that is an altar. There is no iconostasis, but this altar has an iconographic program of the iconostasis. It has uh, the icons, of course, they are of the, from the later period, the paintings themselves, but I think that their uh, topic is uh, preserved. So Virgin Mary and Christ with altar tables, uh, so part of the iconostasis program. And uh, in the upper part of this uh, altar piece, uh, we have sculptures of apostles. So the row, the tier of apostles from the iconographic program of the iconostasis. Uh, once again, the uh, architectonic structure in uh, Powotsk, not preserved one in Berezvec, uh, with uh, also so, uh, open spaces that pr uh, enabled to see behind it uh, and to uh, move, uh, l to let light to come through this uh, composition. Of course, uh, in Powodsk in Berezvec here you do not have the paintings that should be there as well. Uh, so, uh, going to conclusion, uh, at the end of my uh, talk I would like to repeat, so show you once more these points, uh, these uh, kinds of uh, changes that occurred in Basilian monasteries uh, in the 18th century. And what I would like to stress at the end of this uh, paper uh, is that um, it's only part of the picture. Because uh, I focus on art, on artistic activities, artistic production, uh, but uh, it was an element of a much wider process of uh, modernization, of reform of the uh, both Basilian order and the Union Church as a whole. As uh, Professor Zieletska uh, told you, it was a matter of organization of uh, the order and the diocese. Uh, but for, uh, to provide another example, um, Ivan Almes uh, made an investigation on uh, reading and shown uh, very well uh, this change from reading focused on prayer to only on prayer to reading uh, devoted to uh, pastoral and educational uh, activities. So it was a big process of opening to the society and also of the modernization uh, of the uh, Holy Union Church and here in particular uh, of the Basilian order. Um, and uh, here maybe that's a point, I would not answer it, that's maybe a point for, uh, for the discussion. Uh, we can consider whether it's uh, late Tridentine reform introduced in the Latin Church, in the Union Church, only after the um, already mentioned Synod in Zamość, uh, or is it a Union version of uh, the Catholic Enlightenment? Um, and I think 
yeah, uh, with uh, some other uh, pictures, uh, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Melchior. And uh, I suggest we we go to uh, coffee break for uh, until uh, fifteen thirty, and after we come back here with our last two guests and the questions discussion also. So remember your question, please, <laughs> for the uh, for the discussion. Thank you for our first guest of this session, and uh, let's uh, let's have a coffee, please. <laughs>